In this video, we continue with the renal system series starting with peritoneal dialysis. Now, before we start, be sure to download the free PDF study guide with this video to enhance your learning. The link is listed below. Peritoneal dialysis How does peritoneal dialysis work compared to hemodialysis? Well, the peritoneum acts as the dialyzing membrane semi-permeable membrane to achieve dialysis, and the membrane is accessed by insertion of a PD catheter through the abdomen. PD occurs via the transfer of fluid and solute from the bloodstream through the peritoneum into the dialysate solution. In order for PD to be efficient, it still uses the process of osmosis, diffusion and ultrafiltration. The peritoneal membrane is large and porous, allowing solutes and fluid to move via osmosis from an area of higher concentration in the body to an area of lower concentration in the dialyzing fluid. The peritoneal cavity is rich in capillaries, therefore it provides ready access to the blood supply. Contraindications to PD there are conditions of a patient that won't allow the option of PD. These are peritonitis, recent abdominal surgery, abdominal adhesions, other GI problems such as diverticulosis. Access for PD Let's go over more about how the access for peritoneal dialysis works. If you remember from the previous video of hemodialysis, there are definitely major differences. A siliconized rubber catheter, such as a Tenkoff catheter, is surgically inserted into the patient's peritoneal cavity to allow infusion of dialysis fluid. The catheter site is covered by a sterile dressing that is changed daily and when soiled or wet. The preferred insertion site is 3 to 5 cm below the umbilicus. The catheter is tunnelled under the skin, deep enough through the fat and muscle tissue to the peritoneum. How does the catheter remain stable? It is stabilised with inflatable Dacron cuffs in the muscle and under the skin. Over a period of 1 to 2 weeks following insertion, Fibroblasts and blood vessels grow around the cuffs, fixing the catheter in place and providing an extra barrier against dialysate leakage and bacterial invasion. If the patient is scheduled for transplant surgery, the PD catheter may be either removed or left in place if the need for dialysis is suspected post-transplantation. The Dialysate Solution Dialysis involves dialysate solution. From the previous video, we remember that the solution is sterile. The solution contains electrolytes and minerals and has a specific osmolarity, specific glucose concentration and other medication additives as prescribed. The higher the glucose concentration, the greater the hypertonicity and the amount of fluid removed during a PD exchange. What else could be added to the dialysate solution? Well, if hyperkalemia is not a problem, potassium may be added to each bag of diacylate solution. Heparin is added to the diacylate solution to prevent clotting of the catheter. Prophylactic antibiotics may be added to the dialysate solution to prevent peritonitis. And lastly, insulin may be added to the dialysate solution for the client with diabetes mellitus. PD infusion. Let's go over the most important concepts of PD infusion. Let's start by knowing what one exchange is considered to be. It requires three processes, which are infusion, dwell and drain. What is a fill? A fill is one to two liters of dialysate that is infused by gravity into the peritoneal space, which usually takes 10 to 20 minutes. The dwell time is the amount of time that the dialysate solution remains in the peritoneal cavity that can last 20 to 30 minutes to 8 or more hours, depending on the type of dialysis used. The drain, which is the outflow, 
means fluid drains out of the body by gravity into the drainage bag. Nursing actions with PD infusion. Interventions before treatment include monitoring vital signs, monitoring daily weight on the same scale, having the patient void if possible, assessing electrolyte and glucose levels, assessing the peritoneal catheter, dressing and site. Interventions during treatment include monitoring vital signs, monitoring for respiratory distress, pain or discomfort, monitoring for signs of pulmonary edema, monitoring for hypotension and hypertension, monitoring for malaise, nausea and vomiting, assessing the catheter side dressing for wetness or bleeding, monitoring dwell time as prescribed by the doctor, initiating outflow, turn the client from side to side if the outflow is slow to start, monitoring outflow which should be a continuous stream after the clamp is opened, monitoring outflow for colour and clarity, monitoring intake and output accurately. If outflow is less than inflow, the difference is equal to the amount absorbed or retained by the client during dialysis and should be counted as intake. Crucial to know are the following. Never allow dwell time to extend beyond the doctor's prescription because this increases the risk for hyperglycemia. An outflow greater than inflow as well as the appearance of bright red blood or cloudiness in the outflow should be reported immediately. Types of PD the two different types of PD are continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis and automated peritoneal dialysis. Let's go over continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis first. Continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis closely resembles renal function because it is a continuous process. The pro is that it does not require a machine for the procedure. It also promotes client independence. How it works is that the patient performs self-dialysis 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Four dialysis cycles are usually administered in a 24-hour period, including an overnight 8-hour dwell time. Now, let's go over automated peritoneal dialysis. Automated dialysis requires a peritoneal cycling machine. The machine can be done as intermittent peritoneal dialysis, continuous cycling peritoneal dialysis or nightly peritoneal dialysis. The main difference is that the exchanges are automated instead of manual. Complications of peritoneal dialysis Like all types of treatment options, comes a few complications. The most common and important complications to know are peritonitis, abdominal pain, abnormal outflow and insufficient outflow. Let's go over peritonitis first. Peritonitis is basically an infection, either in the catheter insertion site or the peritoneum. The main nursing action is to monitor for signs and symptoms of peritonitis, which are fever, cloudy outflow, rebound abdominal tenderness, abdominal pain, general malaise, nausea and vomiting. Another sign of peritonitis includes cloudy or opaque outflow, which is an early sign of peritonitis. So, what is the first action you do when you suspect peritonitis? Take a moment to think of the answer and pause here. If peritonitis is suspected, obtain a sample for culture and sensitivity of the outflow to determine the infective organism. Once the organism is determined, antibiotics may be added to the dialysate. What are the ways to prevent infection? One important way is to maintain a meticulous, sterile technique when connecting and disconnecting the PD solution bags and when caring for the catheter insertion site. Also, preventing the catheter insertion site dressing from becoming wet during care of the client or the dialysis procedure. 
Change the dressing if wet or soiled. OK, let's go over the next complication of PD, which is abdominal pain. What causes abdominal pain in the first place? Well, the peritoneal irritation during inflow commonly causes major discomfort during the first few exchanges. The pain usually disappears after one to two weeks of dialysis treatment. One way to help reduce pain is to warm the dialysate before administration using a special dialysate warmer pad because the cold temperature of the dialysate can cause discomfort. The next complication is abnormal outflow. Any of the following signs indicate major issues. Here are a few examples. Bloody outflow after the first few exchanges indicates vascular complications. The outflow should be clear after the initial exchange. Brown outflow indicates bowel perforation. Urine colored outflow indicates bladder perforation. Cloudy outflow indicates peritonitis. The next complication to cover is insufficient outflow. What is the main cause of insufficient outflow? It is usually from having a full colon. The most important nursing action is to encourage a high fiber diet because constipation can cause inflow and outflow problems. Stool softeners may be given if there is an order. Besides a full colon, an insufficient outflow may also be caused by catheter migration out of the peritoneal area. If this occurs, an X-ray will be prescribed to evaluate catheter position. Here are nursing actions to follow after treatment of an insufficient outflow. Maintain the drainage bag below the client's abdomen. Check for kinks in the tubing. Change the client's outflow position by turning the client to a side-lying position or ambulating a client. Check for fibrin clots in the tubing and milk the tubing to dislodge the clot as prescribed. So, that concludes this video. Join us in the next video as we cover continuous renal replacement therapy. As always, thanks for watching.